Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, my name's Art Jolly, and I wanted to give a little bit of a background in, in who I am and, and what I do. So I am a volcano seismologist, which means I study earthquakes that occur on volcanoes. And these are important, obviously, because uh, uh, volcanoes, when they go into a state of unrest or eruption, they produce seismic signals. And these seismic signals are probably some of the best indicators that uh, something potentially could happen in the future. So I say I'm a volcano seismologist, but I also specialize in volcano acoustics. And just to mention that, uh, that uh, 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 volcanoes not only produce uh, seismic shaking, so uh, what you think as earthquakes that, that go out and you can feel, or they can be recorded on seismic sensors, but they also produce explosions or fusions or lava ejections. And those produce sound waves. And those sound waves can be recorded uh, on sensors also. And so I specialize in both types of waves. And I'll talk to you guys today about this, which is seismoacoustic eruption monitoring. Seismo being the seismic, the ground shaking, and acoustic being the sounds that a volcano will make. And just a little bit about my background. I went to university up in Alaska way back in uh, the uh, 1990s, and uh, I uh, I worked there for, or I was uh, worked, I was there as a student, and I worked up there for about 10 years, and then I I uh, went and traveled uh, to various places in the world looking for jobs as you do when you're starting out. You, uh, you uh, uh, will accept jobs uh, just about anywhere in the world. And I went over to uh, the West Indies and worked on a volcano called Montserrat, which was a very dangerous volcano in the West Indies that erupted in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, so I was there uh, from about 2000 to, 2000, uh, 2000 to 2003, or 1999 to 2003. And then I came over to Hawaii, and I worked at the University of Hawaii at Hilo as a professor there. And uh, I taught students uh, uh, seismology and volcanoes while I was there. And then my wife and I uh, happened to find a job in New Zealand, so that was the next stop in, in our, our life. And we, uh, so we picked up our kids and we moved to New Zealand and I lived there for about 14, 15 years. Um, and just recently I uh, came back to Hawaii, took a job with the U.S. Geological Survey this time and working with some of the same people that I knew back in the early 2000s. So that gives you a sense of what I, where I've been and what I've kind of done. And this talk here, because because I uh, have worked in a lot of places in the South Pacific, and I've only recently moved to Hawaii, I'm still learning, learning the ropes about Hawaii uh, volcanoes. Uh, and I know of probably a bit more about some of the volcanoes that I've worked uh, on before. So I'll give you some, uh, a, a peek into some volcanoes that I've worked on before. And then I'll try to show how that might relate to the volcanoes that that you guys have in your back, backyards. And uh, I'm happy to take questions either during the talk or if you have something that you just don't understand, um, or after the talk, if you want to talk uh, afterwards. So we'll start off. With uh, a little bit of a discussion, as I said, I worked in, I worked in New Zealand for many, many years. And I happen to work on several volcanoes in the, in the South Pacific, in addition to the New Zealand volcanoes. And I want to show you some examples from a couple of volcanoes that I worked at in a small country called Vanuatu, which is a lovely, lovely uh, small archipelago uh, in, uh, in the South Pacific. They're very uh, friendly and uh, nice people who live there, and they have lots of volcanoes that produce uh, volcanic eruptions and uh, caused some problems for the local population. And a 
first case study that I wanted to talk with you about is a place called Ambai, which is in Vanuatu. And I, you saw the picture of where it was in, in Vanuatu. And uh, Ambai is a small shield volcano. So it's very much like our shield volcanoes, Mauna Loa, uh, Kilauea, Hualalai. It's very much like them. It's a fairly big island. It's maybe on the order of, uh, I think it's on the order of um, 10 miles across from, from there to there. And it has a population of about, or had a population of about 11,000 people. Um, and that volcano went into a state of unrest uh, back in 2017. And, and uh, so the company that I was working for, uh, they have a close relationship with the meteorological group that does uh, monitoring and weather weather monitoring and volcano monitoring in Vanuatu. And uh, so they sent a group of uh, our scientists out to work with the local scientists there. And we did a, we, we were, because I'm a seismologist, we installed some seismic and acoustic sensors around this volcano. Now the thing about this volcano, Ambai is, is a tropical island, much like the islands that we have here. Its uh, population is generally um, uh, farming and agrarian. 95% of the population of the people there, they make a living, they basically sustain themselves by the crops that they make, uh, put in the ground and, and collect. And so they're living uh, uh, from the crops that they make. And the, the, the side aspect of that is that if you have a volcanic eruption, and you have crop failures, you can go from having, uh, having uh, your food available to you to being uh, food poor in literally a week or so, and uh, not having abil an ability to uh, support yourself and your family. And when this happens, uh, there, are, there are issues for the, for the local government and the national government. So we went out there and we deployed some sensors. We, we wanted to help the local, the local monitoring agency with their, with their monitoring and their decision making. The other aspect about it is that if you have an eruption, it produces this ash. It fouls, it fouls the water in the cistern. It's all, it's all local water supply. And as soon as you get ash in it, it uh, becomes an acidic muck. And it's undrinkable. And so very quickly, you have no water and no food. So it becomes a pretty bad situation pretty quickly. And this shows just uh, while we were out there for a couple of weeks, uh, and this shows the uh, local field team and me and my colleague who went out there and we installed these sensors. This shows a typical installation. This shows some ash falling, falling from the sky at this little village. And this shows an onset of an eruption. And this shows a big ash anvil that's uh, moving across the island from the, the center of the volcano as it's erupting. And, uh, and, um, and so uh, we were out there for approximately two weeks collecting data. And, uh, and uh, the, local, the local staff members had expertise in talking to local locals about about the impact problems with the volcano. This again shows, shows the volcano. This shows some data we collected. The top one is seismic data, so ground shaking. And you can see these are eruptions. All of these things are actually eruptions. Big earthquakes. And this down on the bottom is the acoustic signal. It's, it's uh, sound waves that are propagating across the island and being recorded. And you can see event after event of eruption after eruption that occurred. And they very quickly mobilized uh, evacuation. And this shows one of the, one of the cargo vessels that actually uh, the local, they would go to a local village and all people would gather up all their supply, all their home belongings, put them on the, on the barge. And you can see all the people here, hundreds of people and they would ship them over to the neighbor island. 
that how serious it was for these guys in terms of their, their food supply, their water supply. So it was really critical that these guys were, uh, were evacuated until the eruption ended and then they could go back home. So that, that just shows you what kind of uh, 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 activity happens uh, when, when you have a volcanic eruption in one of these South Pacific islands. This right here shows an, another volcano that's in Vanuatu. It's very near there. It's called Yasur Volcano. And Yasur is famous for a different reason. It is erupting every couple of minutes. It will produce an explosion. And I have a little video clip that I'll show you here. And uh, here, it's, uh, it's uh, because this volcano erupts and erupts and erupts and erupts, it's perfect for scientists to go and study the seismic waves and the acoustic waves that, that, uh, that occur on these volcanoes. And it can tell you some things about, about uh, the hazards of the volcano. Let me show you just quickly. This is from a, a, uh, a camera on a drone. You can see the explosion occurs. And that explosion shoots out all this, what, what are called ballistics. And keep an eye right there in the front of the screen. You see that, the, uh, that it actually put a ballistic right where the, ca where the camera and the drone was prior to that. I'll show that one more time, just so you can see it a little more clearly. And what I want you to, to, to note here is these ballistics are going in a specific direction. And that's actually quite important. Do you guys know about uh, Mount St. Helens, the eruption that occurred, occurred about, what, 1980? So it's about 40 years ago, probably now. That was a directed eruption. And this is a nice example of a very small volcano that produces a directed eruption, an eruption that produces uh, materials that are moving sideways from the volcano. And these things are actually really, really important because uh, there are example after example after example of these, these sideways directed eruptions and uh, the hazards that are posed by the people been killed by these sideways directed eruptions. So this study was actually, was uh, when we were there, we actually studied, uh, um, have you seen these same kind of eruptions on Kilauea or Mauna Loa? Uh, not really, no. There have been big eruptions in Kilauea or in Mauna Loa, but mostly uh, uh, they are either um, Fissure lava eruptions, and not uh, like uh, directed, lateral directed. There may be, I have seen small laterally directed fountains of lava, but it's very local, so it doesn't present, generally wouldn't present a hazard. But that's a really, that's a really uh, good question. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not sure why it's not, we go to the next one. Yeah, there we go. So I'll just talk very quickly about this thing about source processes. And what I want to mention here is this idea that if an eruption occurs, there are hazards associated with eruptions, not in Hawaiian volcanoes generally, but uh, globally with these things that are pushing, pushing laterally and they can cause big problems uh, for local populations. Japan had one very recently. Uh, New Zealand has had problems with these types of eruptions, <clears throat> etc. And this just shows an example of, a, of an experiment that I did at my former uh, company where we basically, we launched a helium balloon. And on that helium balloon, we strung a set of acoustic sensors to listen to sounds. And then we uh, hovered it over that same volcano that you saw the video on. And, uh, and we recorded the different uh, uh, amplitudes of the acoustic waves that occur. And what's important is, if you look at this plot here, it shows you that uh, when we have scientists who measure the direction of the, of the rocks that fly out of the volcano, they are pointed 
specifically to the south and south south and southeast. <clears throat> so there is directionality, and we wanted to see if you could see that in. Oops, I went too far. In the in the, in the acoustic data, the noise, the sound data, and this shows that there are the brighter colors means more uh, more uh, stronger acoustic waves. Blue means weaker acoustic waves. And in general, depending on the crater that you're looking at, you have uh, this direct directivity eastward and southward there. And there it's more vertical in the northern crater. So it shows discrepancies and similarities to, uh, to the actual data. <clears throat> Let's shift again. This time we're going to go to Tonga. Tonga was the site of the, la the largest eruption, uh, well, certainly of this century that we're currently in, and since about 100 years uh, when Krakatoa erupted. And so Tonga, again, it erupted in uh, 2022, start of 2022, and initially there was an eruption back in 20, uh, 2009, which was an a uh, very near surface underwater eruption. And that eruption, there are two islands out by, uh, by this volcanic vent. And those islands, because there was an eruption, it created a, um, a beach that connected the two islands together. And then uh, in 2022, this big massive underwater eruption occurred and it actually, um, destroyed much of, much of that beach, much of that this beach got destroyed as a result of that eruption. And that was uh, back in 2021, there was minor eruptive activity, early as 2022, uh, there was a, a, a big, 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 large, global, globally sized eruption. Again, probably the biggest eruption in, in the century. This shows the barometric observations, so basically the sound the low frequency sound from that eruption at a local seismic station uh, uh, at the capital. And this shows some acoustic observations from New Zealand. Again, you can see the distortion here in this time record, time skips down with each one of these one hour, one hour, one hour, so you can see this onset of the eruption. And this shows another set of acoustic uh, sensors uh, in New Zealand. And this shows some acoustic observations here in Hawaii associated with the eruption several thousand kilometers or several thousand miles away. And that eruption uh, was uh, recorded uh, at uh, this ISL, ISLA lab that's run by Milton Garces. He lives here in Kona. And he runs a, runs a local acoustics lab. And he recorded on this on several types of sensors. These are actually Google phones and iPhones, that kind of stuff. And he was able to record them on uh, that eruption. And this shows uh, some sensors that were uh, collected by our HBO acoustic network associated with a big, massive eruption. So how do these waves propagate so far uh, in the atmosphere? How, could they, how can you get a, a, a volcanic eruption that occurs thousands of, thousands of miles away, and yet it produces a signal that you can see uh, on your seismic sensors? And some people can actually even, could actually even hear these things. In Alaska, they heard the eruption that occurred in Tonga. Just amazing, just, just uh, uh, amazing. And the answer can be found in this uh, concept of ducting. And we'll talk a little bit about ducting. And this shows basically some seismic signatures. Uh, and they occur uh, for an eruption that occurred in a place called Manawai. But these things are actually recorded a long ways away from, from uh, Kermitic Islands down in the South Pacific. And I'll show you. They burn it. What does it sound like? Is it like a thrill? Like a vibration. Do you have any examples? Yeah. Of yeah. Most of most of the sounds are what they call infrasound, and you can't actually hear them. But in Alaska, 
there were uh, certain atmospheric conditions, and they described it kind of almost as a crackling sound, and it was, you could hear it. You know, the people in Alaska, it was usually a, like in the very quiet little villages, you know, they don't have very many cars in some places. It can be very quiet. It can be, I think it was uh, nighttime at the time, and very cold, and people could actually hear, hear that sound. Yeah, uh, that's the only place I'd heard that they'd heard it all the way up in Alaska. So, this is down in the South Pacific. This is Manawai. You go all the way over here to the Mid-Atlantic. And in the Mid-Atlantic, there's this place where they have some acoustic sensors. And those acoustic sensors actually picked up Manawai eruption. Not the Tonga eruption, but a different eruption called Manawai. So this thing propagated all the way into the ocean, in the ocean, on, and was recorded on sub, submarine uh, sensors that recorded these things. What would be the propagation times? So the, the propagation times? Oh, this right here, I think it's on the order of 1,500, uh, so 1.5 kilometers a second. So you're talking to go from here to here. It's probably, oh, it's hours, maybe maybe even a day or so. And uh, if I go to the next slide, yeah, this this kind of explains why this happens. So this is the acoustic. This is uh, this is water. If you have an ocean basin. You have depth down to about five kilometers in the ocean basin, and this shows the velocity that a, that a uh, hydro uh, hydrologic sensor or a wave in the ocean or a sound wave in the ocean would propagate. And the minimum velocity is about uh, 1,470 meters per second, kilometers per second. Is that right? That seems wrong. It's not kilometers per second. I believe that's meters per second. That's a typo. It's my typo, but I believe that's a typo. I think it's on the order of 1,500 meters per second. And this is the minimum. And what's happening here is this thing called hydroacoustic ducting. And when you have a low velocity layer that's throughout the ocean, it's caused by uh, temperature at shallow depth and pressure as you go to deeper depth. And that causes this, this uh, profile. And this is your dot. This preferentially guides sound waves in the ocean. And, uh, and when it does that, it's a very efficient way for sound to, to move in the ocean. And that's how you can get these things to propagate halfway through the Earth or on the surface or in the ocean and still be recorded uh, in the South Atlantic from a Pacific uh, source. Now this goes back to Tonga, going back to Tonga. Uh, some colleagues um, of mine did a big analysis of uh, acoustic sensors all over the earth and they found that they recorded these, uh, again this is now uh, in the atmosphere, the atmospheric waves of this, uh, of this eruption that propagated up several several tens of kilometers, oscillated, and then propagated laterally all the way around the Earth. And what happened was, you can see here, they measured the arrivals at each of these these stations, and each of these dots on this thing is a is a, is a station that measures the acoustic or the pressure or the barometric pressure in the Earth. And what happens here, you see this like up and down, up and down, up and down, up. And what happens is it records, and that is just further, this is distance here. With further distance, it actually goes, and it goes all the way around the Earth, and this is where the waves go out around the Earth, and then they, they come back together right there in northern Africa, and then they propagate around the Earth again and again, and again. So you see it goes up, down, up, down, up, down. Each of, the, each of these is uh, at, the, 
at the volcano, the opposite side of the Earth, at the volcano, opposite side of the Earth, again and again. It propagated around the Earth one, two, three times, and these are days, I do believe. These are days. So it took about a day and a half for this thing to propagate around the Earth. And it did it again and again and again. About four times. It propagated three and a half times. It was seen to propagate around the Earth. And this was documented on hundreds and, and all, like uh, thousands of uh, acoustic sensors around the Earth. Big, 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 big signal. Really impressive. So we talked about this simple example of propagation in the ocean. In the air, there are also these things called waveguides. And they are very efficient ways of propagating acoustic signals in the atmosphere. And uh, this happens because you have various layers in the Earth. You have the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere. And those have different temperatures and temperatures and velocity profiles. And again, there are areas where you have lower velocities and higher velocities. And there are preferred uh, uh, elevations above the Earth where you can guide these acoustic waves very efficiently. This shows here uh, what is basically wave propagation um, rays that are going through the Earth. And it shows, this really is supposed to show the effect of wind. And if you look at uh, trade winds, they're going mostly in a certain direction. And that means that wave propagation eastward is going to be different from wave propagation westward. And so you can get more efficient propagation depending on the wind patterns. And that's, uh, that's actually well modeled um, in this particular paper. Now, we'll zoom back into Mauna Loa. And I'm doing, a, I'm doing an analysis right now on the acoustic waves at Mauna Loa associated with the, with the November-December eruption of last year. It's just about a, a, year, a year and a month ago last year. And this shows uh, the Mauna Loa summit. And these yellow blocks show existing acoustic arrays that we have around the volcano. And this shows where the lava flows that occurred during the Mauna Loa eruption and uh, active fissures that uh, were available, which effectively tell you that the eruption moved through time. Sometimes it was, uh, it initially was at the summit and then it moved down the, um, the rift zone and into the flanks and produce these sub-fissures that were active later in the eruption. And this just shows some standard uh, uh, HBO processing. This is just a, a, some raw uh, acoustic data that is uh, just uh, plotted for the purpose of uh, visualization. And this shows uh, some specific processing that we do to the data where we basically take sets of arrays and we assume like a like a, uh, if you think of a, a dropping a rock in a pond and then that pond causes waves to go go out to the shore if you have uh, sensors in an array so you have them apart from each other then they'll see those waves and then it can point back to a direction where the, uh, where the waves came from. And in this case, really disorganized, not very, not very coherent. And then it starts locking in to a specific, um, a specific uh, here, a back azimuth. So not very good. And then it locks into this very nice, tight azimuth. And what it says is, you have uh, sets of sensors around you. And it says, you have an eruption likely to be occurring in this direction. So we do that with, we have the same kind of processing operating on all our HBO arrays. And we actually take in the University of Hawaii array also. 
and we process that and we view this stuff uh, and it confirms, okay, there's an eruption occurring or maybe the eruption has migrated and moved to a different fissure. So that just is a very local example of, uh, of that particular type of processing. How far in advance did you know that was happening? Oh, it, uh, the one thing about acoustic uh, processing, it doesn't give you any kind of um, forecasting capability. It just tells you if something's happened. Yeah. So, or it can tell you if something is evolving, like it's moving to a different place. Yeah. The, the, down, the downward uh, aspects of making information available comes when, okay, this has moved to a different place. What are the implications for a population or a highway that might be in the way of that shift? So that's where the, uh, the value of of that kind of process. Like when it was going across the saddle road. That yeah, that exactly. Area to be blocked off. Exactly. It just it gives uh, gives people or gives the uh, the county uh, some additional information uh, about what uh, the situation is, and that they can make better decisions. Yeah. On the acoustical monitoring, is it just audible frequencies, or is it very low frequencies? Low frequencies. Almost oh, all of this is, is sub sub audible. It's uh, in, infrasound, is what we call it. A few hertz to the yeah. Oh, so uh, we do processing to 100 hertz, but uh, uh, there's a thing called the Nyquist frequency, which means that you can only really resolve things below 50 hertz. Audible. Uh, so what you could sound the sounds that you could hear they're generally a thousand hertz or a hundred hertz and very uh, smart people, or not smart people, but uh, people with very good hearing can hear maybe down to 25 or 20 hertz. And these things, most of them are down about 5 hertz to 10 hertz, somewhere around there, 1 hertz. So very low frequency. Get here. Uh, I'm going to now shift. Looks like we're doing okay. I'm going to shift now to... Uh, Earthquakes, because earthquakes are more useful for actually um, doing things like forecasting or giving warning, early warnings about impending activity. And I'll talk first about some some different types of earthquakes. And most of most of us really know about about standard rock failure. Okay, an earthquake occurs, the ground shakes, and that's just basically the rock fractures and you have slip along a fault. Okay, that's what 99.8% of earthquakes in the world look like. And their process is rock breaking. But when you get into volcanoes, then you have lots of things happening. You have hot materials, you have materials with lots of uh, gases in them, and so they have fluids percolating through the system, and you have the motion, the movement of magma. And so you produce different kinds of seismic signals and they're quite unique to volcanoes or other places that have these fluid migrations in the subsurface. And then you can produce different weird kinds of signals. And this shows something called an L LP earthquake, which is long period. This one's volcano tectonic, VT. LP is long period. And that's, you can see, it's much slower, longer oscillation. And that's uh, actually indicative. People think that it's a result of fluid flow in, down in the earth. And so that's why these things often occur um, associated with uh, volcanoes and unrested volcanoes. Now, uh, there are also a subset of earthquakes that are increasingly being observed, and I call them personally HF earthquakes or high-frequency earthquakes. They have a lot of features like this LP earthquake, but this is, this is usually one frequency, and it's long period. It's about two hertz, one to two hertz. This is more like four to five hertz, but it's still one frequency. And we call those HF. And uh, I think that these things are a result of, uh, again, fluid flow, but uh, fluid flow specifically in a very hot environment. 
And I can explain that in detail if, if people want. And then there are these things, and they are called VLP. And you can see here, there's some, some higher frequency and lower frequency, but overall there's this very low frequency and at about 10 to 20 seconds duration. And that's VLP. And that's associated with some rapid near source deformation. This shows an example event. This one is in uh, New Zealand. And it shows this nasty noise. And then you can see this signal coming in here. And it looks like you can see different kinds of things in that signal. If you look at the, if you look at the characteristics, the waveform characteristics, there's actually features that are very low frequency, low frequency, and high frequency in that signal. And if you do some filtering on the data, you can see you can separate out this high frequency, LP, low frequency, and BLP signal, all in one event there. So this tells you something about the process that's going on underneath that volcano. Going back to rock breaking, because rock breaking is one of the most fundamental and important parts of kind of trying to monitor a volcano. And I had a student um, about 10 years ago now, really a great student. Her name was Lorianne Chardon. And she did this analysis of uh, increasing seismic energy on volcanoes. And she did a fantastic job. And we can ignore some of the, some of the math behind it. But basically, she looked at what happens when uh, you have an increase in the energy release of a volcano, and how does that relate to the probability of an eruption? And she did this at a volcano in New Zealand. And what she found was that when you have these increases, rapid increases in the acceleration of the seismic energy, that that, that is uh, associated with an increased likelihood of volcanic eruption. A really nice result, and she did this, and she did it in a really robust statistical way, and said, okay, even though the volcano she did it at was, uh, was a volcano that was uh, really, really hard to um, uh, forecast at, really hard, she was still say, able to say, okay, even though it's very hard to forecast here, if we just take the, this increase in seismicity, that uh, gives you an x-fold increase in the probability of an eruption that is going to occur if you have this increase in seismicity. So going back again to Hawaii, we, we know before the Mauna Loa eruption that uh, there was a slow increase in seismicity, and I only did this for a couple of, a couple, uh, maybe a year, about a year or so, uh, a couple of years it looks like. Uh, and you can see that rates of seismicity are going along, going along, and then in October 2022 they started to increase, or actually July 2022 they started to increase, and then they increased and increased some more, and the eruption occurred right there. And we actually increased our alert level. We, we gave information statements uh, well ahead of this. And one of the reasons was the seismicity going up in this way. And as my student had shown, and as we know from volcanoes around the world, the increasing rates of seismicity uh, tell you to be more watchful give more warnings, and, uh, and try to get people prepared. And so that's kind of the thinking that, that we uh, globally, people use to help them understand unrest at volcanoes. And this just shows where these, thing, these things are actually located, these earthquakes that occur. This uh, shifts over to Kilauea Volcano. And Kilauea Volcano has had you guys are probably aware, it's been just going bonkers. Lots of eruptions over the past few years. And, uh, and each of these eruptions, thankfully, is uh, behaving according to the same pattern. 
increasing rates of seismicity uh, tell you to be a little more cautious, be a little more aware, give information to uh, the people who are interested in this information and feel uh, that uh, there, may be, there may be issues for public safety like the National Park, etc. And so this shows example of two eruptions that occurred in 2023 and those eruptions, each of them preceded, preceded increases in seismicity ahead of those eruptions. And they also increased, uh, uh, were associated with increased information releases from HBO. What points are there? Gap for the activity flow. Oh, it was a uh, inner inner event low. You know, you had an eruption, things settled down. The volcano was in a happy state for a little bit, but then more magma started to move into the shallow shallow uh, surface. Are you going to touch on what's happening with Kilauea today? Kilauea today. Uh, Kilauea today. Um, well, I look at the reports every day. Okay. But the reports every day, I thought, like, it looks like the USGS is unsure. It, they're not sure, so I thought maybe you actually... It's been, it's been reasonably quiet compared to, uh, like, uh, about a month ago when we had, uh, we had lots of deformation stuff. It's been reasonably... We've been reasonably uh, less stressed out uh, in the past month or so. Uh, if I, I... I haven't looked today because I was so busy preparing yeah. my talk, so I apologize. But uh, yeah, it, uh, it is, I think people are, at this, you're always <coughs> watchful, we're always watchful, but uh, the deformation isn't strong right now, and the seismicity isn't going bonkers like it has. I'll show you some examples of this in the next couple of slides. It looks like we're in good, in good shape for time, and, and I'm going to start to close in, because I don't want to over, over, um, overdo this. There was an analysis by my colleague, uh, Nympha Bennington, and she, uh, and she uh, did, did this uh, uh, report, and I thought it was so nice. She did such a great job that I wanted to highlight it here. And this shows ahead of uh, the, the latest uh, eruption that occurred at the volcano, and it, was, it shows the onset of this thing. So quiet, quiet, and then boom, 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 boom. You see all these little earthquakes. And the earthquakes are getting bigger, and they're becoming more frequent, and they are uh, uh, exciting an area around a deformation zone uh, near Kilauea Volcano. So this is again time going down through, and then she goes uh, time in, and uh, uh, I believe it is... <coughs> I believe these are different uh, different sensors. 4:30 Sunday HST. I'll shift down. Continues boom 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 boom. Gets stronger and stronger and stronger. The seismic shaking is occurring. Several reasonably large events, hundreds of events occurring through time. And then what happens is right around here the individual earthquakes stop and uh, the, the fissure opens up, lava starts coming out in, inside of Kilauea uh, Halamamo Crater. And then along with that uh, stopping, you get uh, this increase in this background signal that occurs right here. And that's tremor. That's just uh, so, some humming of the volcano as, as, uh, as it shifts from individual ground breaking rock cracking kind of events to uh, uh, almost the volcano going into say, oh, and relaxing a bit and then going into this different seismic state which is just persistent tremor. You can see that that occurs uh, hour after hour after hour. You can see that it slowly wanes, but it can last for several days, actually. So that, that shows you what happened there. And this is later, later, later. And you can see that it wanes further, gets lower and lower amplitude uh, tremor as the flow of, uh, of the magma out of Halabama Crater <coughs> slows down. 
but I want you to know, okay, this, this concept that I, I wanted to give you about this acceleration of rock breaking occurring, leading to eruption. This shows that, this shows five different eruptions, the last five eruptions that have occurred uh, in about a year and a half or something, maybe uh, actually two years, two or three years. Um, and it shows the last three eruptions of last year. And you could see these are earthquakes that occur in map view. And you could see that each of these eruptions were preceded by a different kind of uh, pattern in where the earthquakes were located and how that deformation was being responded to by uh, the overlying burden of uh, rock. And as it did in this first eruption, you had activity in South Caldera and it propagated down the Southeast Rift Zone. And there it propagated even further down the Southeast Rift Zone. And then in 2023, it actually started to propagate down the Southwest Rift Zone. And it went even further down the Southwest Rift Zone. And then even further down the Southwest Rift Zone. But each of them ended up, the relief occurred the Halamamau Crater. So even though we have these signatures, and they're all related to this fundamental process of, of you have this cold, well, at the time, cold rock, it's keeping magma down below. It's, uh, its happiest state is, is to have the hot magma down below, but then the magma wants to get up. So you have this competition between magma that wants to get uh, get out of the out of the volcano and the overburden that's just there is it's saying well you're not going to get out unless you do something like break some rock okay and so that's what it's doing that's what this whole process this that uh, my students studied in uh, New Zealand it's the same thing you have these in New Zealand it was just little tiny crackle 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 these things you couldn't even measure them as earthquakes they just look like like tremor, but what was happening was you had this thing and it was, it was cracking along, cracking along, and then you have this thing called, uh, it's, it's uh, actually got a name, it's called the failure forecast method, and what happens is that you crackle, 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 and then the strength of that overburden, suddenly it can't hold it any longer. It, it can't hold that, that, uh, that uh, material is trying to buoyantly drive through the system, it can't hold it, so it just accelerates, and then it leads to an eruption. And that's analogous in a bigger picture frame to what's going on here in Kilauea Volcano. You have this overburden, crackle, 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 big crackles, magnitude 2, magnitude 3 earthquakes, and it's trying to keep it in place, but then you have this material that just really wants to get out of there. That competition goes on. And eventually, it exceeds the strength of the material, and it produces an eruption. And that, almost always, the weakest place for it to erupt from is Halamamo Crater, which is thank that's actually a good thing. But that's what's happened. Even though the pattern changes, eruption to eruption to eruption, it's still kind of the same underlying process. OK, this is the last slide. Um, so, uh, basically, volcanoes worldwide share many similarities in terms of the signals they produce. Um, so you go to a volcano in, in uh, Antarctica, New Zealand, uh, Vanuatu, Hawaii, Alaska, they're producing similar kinds of earthquakes. Rock breaking earthquakes, LP earthquakes, these volcanoes produce all of them produce these similar kinds of events. And they tell you different things about what's going on. VLPs, they tell you, they tell you about small deformations that occur in the system. And we can use these things to, to interpret unrest at volcanoes. And it's, it's like a cookbook. Volcanologists around the world see these same kinds of events, volcano to a volcano. They sometimes present in different ways. New Zealand, the volcanoes are really hard to 
hard to interpret because they are such small batches of magma in the frequently erupting volcanoes. And so the batches are so small that you can't really, it's a, it's a real guessing game if it's going to erupt. You can just almost just say, well, we're in a heightened state of unrest, and please beware around this volcano. Um, but they have similar signatures. That's really cool. Uh, it requires significant skill to distinguish a full range of observations. You know, um, I think that, that you guys probably uh, uh, have, a, I hope you have a better understanding of what uh, the monitoring scientists are doing in terms of the seismic data, uh, in terms of uh, interpreting the results and giving information that is going to be useful to you guys. So, uh, but there, there's skill involved in it, and uh, um, uh, I think that skill is hard won and and uh, and uh, useful. Hawaiian volcanoes often have outsized signals compared to other volcanoes globally, and this is, goes back to exactly what I was saying before. When I was in New Zealand, boy, it's hard to it's hard to forecast eruptions in New Zealand, and uh, by comparison. Uh, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's easy here, but the signals are outsized. You have big, uh, you have big, bigger earthquakes, whereas New Zealand, you might have little tiny things that you can barely interpret. Here, you have magnitude two and three earthquakes, and they can give you this forewarning about heightened numbers. Okay, last, uh, last point. Hazards vary from volcano to volcano and may depend strongly on the populations on the flights of volcanic systems. We probably have a lot more resiliency to uh, uh, the types of volcanic hazards that we face compared to people in Vanuatu, for example, who, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they uh, may not have food and they don't have a grocery, they don't even have a grocery store to go to even if they wanted to, and so they're their predicament is far, far more, far different from, from our predicament. And that's not to say a lot of people are farmers here, and so they face that predicament also, I think. But there, it's 95% of the population. Um, and so that's, uh, those are some of my takeaway points. I think, boy, uh, I, went, I went probably longer than I wanted to, but we had some, we had some uh, things, and I'm willing to stay longer and chat. Thank you. Is the ring of fire still a big deal around the Pacific Basin, and is the situation here on the Hawaiian Islands is it independent of that ring of fire? Yeah, I, that's a really good question. I like to say that, that uh, volcanic centers act independently, except in the context of plate tectonics. You know, we have, we have volcanoes, and they, as you say, they, they are in a ring around the Pacific, and those are hazardous zones. Uh, uh, people often ask, did this eruption that occurred in, in New Zealand, was it related to this other eruption that occurred the day before in New Zealand? And only in the context of plate tectonics. They, statistically, are just, they aren't linked. You know, there isn't, there isn't like a pipe of magma between the two. Um, but, uh, uh, and the hot spot here, it's related by plate tectonics to other, other uh, processes that occur globally. Of course, I've read that the Haleakala, you shouldn't refer to it as storm. Is that right? There, there's still suspicion? There's so, suspicion. now you're getting into an area where I, I'd have to speculate, okay. so I, I, I prefer not to, yeah. Uh, a couple months ago, I lived right on Kilauea. A couple months ago, we had a, what I think is a pretty large event, like a magnitude 5.2 earthquake. I would expect that the furniture would be shaking and everything, but I noticed that we never feel them. Is that because the ocean is cushioning it or because it's a volcano? Or do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, so I noticed some, sometimes, I mean, my. I always, if I feel an earthquake, I go into the, I go in and do a felt report. Uh, I, I do it kind of like brushing my teeth, although I don't, I brush my teeth more often than I do felt reports. Um, but uh, 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 
I often notice that something that I thought was stronger uh, was actually a kind of a low magnitude. And it, it's always, it always has, uh, it's always scientific as, uh, parts of it are how deep was it? And sometimes if it's deep but bigger, it'll be wider felt. Sometimes if it's shallow, it uh, may be only very locally felt. And so you have to, you have those kinds of different aspects. And then depends on where you are. Some people feel earthquakes quite sharply, and then other people are in areas that they just don't feel it at all. So it's more and you can see that in the volcano itself. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that we're in the middle of the ocean. Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. I, I, at least I've not, I've not read anything on that uh, in, in the literature. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes? Do people in Vanuatu, did they, you said they went to a neighboring island, right, for evacuation? Yeah. Were they able to move back? Yeah, actually, pretty quickly. Uh, so they actually had two evacuations, one before we were there and then one while we were there. And, uh, and um, they evacuated to two islets, one to the west, which is called Santo, and one to the east, east which is called Milo. And, uh, and people generally on the one side of the island went one direction and on the other side the ferries uh, or the barges took them in, in two directions. And I think it took on the order of maybe five days to a week to get people off the island. And apparently that it was such an interesting, um, I, I love Vanuatu because the people are so wonderful and nice, such gentle folks. Um, but um, uh, the interesting thing is people would move off island and they would have extended families on the neighbor islands they would just start to take up farming. They would give them a, a, a plot of uh, usually forest land, and they would uh, they would clear it out a bit, and they would start growing their crops immediately. And uh, and and uh, after I think after about four or five months, a lot of them moved back, and then they had to evacuate again. But they had already established their kind of kind of uh, home away from home, their second home. And the government actually allowed them, local governments allowed them to keep that, that land that they, they had in other places. Some of them didn't go back. So, and that was actually fairly common. This has happened, I was at a, uh, uh, at a response for another island in Vanuatu called Gao. In that eruption, uh, they, they partially, it wasn't the same because Ambai, the eruption that I showed you, it ashed almost the entire island. It was pretty much unlivable. Everyone had to leave. But in Gawa, the trade winds were in operation during the eruptions, and so it only maybe a, maybe five kilometers along the coast had to be evacuated, and they all evacuated locally. So um, it was actually much easier for that particular response. But uh, yeah, the very resilient, uh, resilient people. So, yeah. I have a quick question. I know that you, the uh, HBO had to evacuate from the Jagger. Where is the office now? I last time I heard you're deciding where it was going to be. So yeah, I we're building a new office on UH Hilo. Okay. Currently, we're right on the waterfront. You know where the canoe, uh, the canoe launch is, yep. um, Hilo waterfront. We're just in back of that. Are you just in Amazon? Sorry? Is that a tsunami zone? Yeah, it's a tsunami. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah. It was an emergency. We had no place else to go. I really enjoyed talking to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.